Chrissy, Sam and Brownie. It's a podcast bonus. John Sylvester, a journalist and crime writer, a co-writer on the Underbelly book series, which is the basis for the Underbelly TV series. He's also developed a relationship with lots of major crime figures, including Mark Chopper Reed. The Stan original documentary Revealed, No Mercy, No Remorse, is available tomorrow on Stan. Here's John. Yes. John Sylvester, I cannot believe you have not been on this program. Chrissy Swan will be mortified when she realised we've interviewed you and she, you are not here. How are you? I'm good. I just didn't realise the pressure you people work under. I came in and you were eating sort of hamburgers out, <laughs> out there in such a frenzy. It was like two lines bring down a wildebeest. Yeah. I wasn't prepared to talk to you at the time. Yeah, yeah when... I, I, that, the the journal and you never lost. I, when you took out your notepad and started writing down what we're eating, I thought this exactly. is this is a you're not going to waste this. But it's wonderful to see you, sir. Thank you, thank you, John. You're very excited about I this, am well, John's we, latest project. Yeah, we're here to talk about the Stan series, uh, which starts uh, which which starts on the 23rd. It's about the famous case here in Melbourne, John. Uh, of Paul Charles Denyer, who murdered three women in the Frankston area in 1993. It really gripped the whole state, to be honest. I was a kid growing up in Warrnambool, and I remember about it, but it certainly gripped Melbourne. It was a six-week period, and three victims, 118, 122, and 117, were all plucked at random. And um, the investigators at the time were people I consider and still consider to be uh, my friends. And I, I remember being at home when it rained and you'd hear it on the roof and he always struck when it rained and I'd be myself filled with dread thinking and not tonight please no so imagine what it would be like for the investigators I mean you work in a pretty power-packed industry you don't want to misspeak you know your previous role as a footballer don't want to miss a goal now imagine that imagine being a homicide detective and there's no CCTV there's no electronics. So what you're doing is you're hoping for a tip from the public and you're going through all known offenders. You work 20 hours a day, you're going home and you're no closer, but you know you're closer to the next murder. That's pressure. The whole community. Tens of thousands of people in virtual lockdown in Frankston. Everyone up to the Premier wanting a result and you are so frightened there'll be another victim. In the final terrible murder of Natalie Russell. Um, I think when you see the documentary, you'll see, particularly one of the investigators, how shattered he still is, that they couldn't have got him before that. But the reality is it was an amazing act by a member of the public, and that was a postie. And she was riding her motorbike, and she saw a car in Sky Road with no back number plate. So she looked in her rearview mirror and she saw a driver sort of slinking down, trying to hide. Days before mobile phones, if she had finished her round, her information would have been no good, but she sees a couple in the front yard and says, going to use your phone. Oh. So goes to the phone, rings the police. Police come within 15 minutes, and they're checking the car. Then you had already got out of the car. He'd already set a trap for a, for a random passerby, he'd put two big holes in the cyclone fence near a golf course. One he was going to hide in and the second he was going to take his victim. So he'd killed Natalie Russell and he came back and he saw the police at the car. So he walked home. So when Natalie's body is discovered, it is the low point of the investigation. He's gone again. But then they get the running sheet from the police saying, we checked this Toyota there and it's owned by this fellow, Paul Charles Denyer. That's when he comes into the frame. So the police go to get him, and Rod Wilson, as good a homicide detective as we've ever seen, just goes, this is not right. He's too cooperative. He's, yeah, I'll come to the station and all the rest, and then they begin the process. Well, there's amazing vision of that, uh, John, where they actually going through, the senior detectives are uh, going through the house with Paul Charles Denyer. And he seems to be really enjoying it, enjoying being part of the investigation. As the investigators say in the documentary, he loved being the star. And so Rod does this, and it's not like you see where it's, you know, third degree or confrontational. It's just chatting, 
going along, going along. 1,500 questions later, Rod drops the trap because there's cuts on his hands. And he asks him about the cuts and, and then he gives an explanation. And Rod sees that physically it couldn't happen the way he said. And that's the first time he calls him out. A pathologist is doing the autopsy and finds a piece of skin, which is from Denya. As he'd been stabbing, he'd actually stabbed his own hand and taken it off. And that's the point where you see Denya look up and go, I think I'm in serious trouble here. Whoa. One of the one of the police who's dragged in is Darrell O'Loughlin, a local detective. And he's sort of just there to hold his hand, basically. But he's a Christian and he's got a crucifix here. And during the interview, Darren is just silently you know, talking to himself, praying, basically, saying, I just want the truth to come out. And Denya turns to him and says, that man's trying to get into my head. And Darren in the documentary says, I saw the evil that those girls saw. Uh, because he's got, as, you, as mm. you see, he's just got a nondescript, chubby face. You wouldn't think of him you know, in, in that way. And then when there's a break, um, he says to Darren, you're a Christian. And he says, yeah. He says, well, I'll tell you, I did it. And then oh. he switches, as you would have seen, yes. from having an answer for everything to being like he's part of the investigation. He, you couldn't get someone as enthusiastically. You really enjoy that. Yeah. John, yeah. why, out of all the stories that you've covered, why this one to be made into a documentary? Well, because you see the killer. You see the interview. But it's... it's as we much- have a fascination with that, don't we? When we see the killer in the interview room, don't we? Because we don't often see that sort of thing. Um, uh, in another case, Justice Frank Vincent said that, you know, basically there's only one question. What made you what you are? Which is what we all want to know. Nature versus nurture. Yeah, and a bit of everything in, in these particular cases. But the clock was ticking. The crimes were becoming quicker and quicker and quicker. And ultimately, the day after Natalie, a group of women go shopping uh, in, a, in a, you know, a, a big car park for the shopping centre. One of their numbers is dozing. So they leave her and the other three go off and they leave the car unlocked. When they come back, there's this battered Toyota next to the, this other car, which is strange because the car park's nearly empty. And they arrive and there's a fellow tinkering with his engine, which was Denya's trick, because if you see a man sitting in a car, he's suspicious. A bloke trying to get his, you know, fix his flat battery is nearly invisible. Really? So the three women walk up and one knows Denya and says, Paul, what are you doing? He had tried to take that woman's daughter out. She had refused and then all their chickens were killed and there were prowlers and all the rest, which we now know was Denya. The woman in the car says, I was dozing and I felt somebody in the car and I thought it was you lot coming back. And in one of the previous cases, a poor young mother with a 12-day-old baby was cooking an omelette for her and her friend and ran out of eggs. So she got, she's driven 600 metres down the road to the milk bar, jumped in, Denya's passing. He hides in the back seat next to the baby cot and waits. She gets in the car, he pulls a knife, makes her drive off. She flashes her lights and tries to drive at a car, but he grabs the wheel back and rests it back and ultimately she's one of the victims. Oh, so, my God. So Denya would have struck, if not that day, um, within days. John, yeah, I, my, our listeners may get a sense of us hanging on every word. Yeah. Right? And, and, and full disclosure, I've been out to lunch with you where I just sat there and hung on every word. Mm. What? Well, there, there's not many conversations you'd be involved in where the other person asks you a question and then just just wants the next ten minutes to listen to your answer. What's a What's it like, mate? You're a wonderful storyteller. Have you always been like this? Like, what, before Before the crime stuff, you you covering anything anything else? Or when you started journalistically, was it Was it crime to begin with? Oh, I wanted to be a political reporter. But I went to police rounds, and yeah. it was full of young blokes like me. And also, you're allowed to drink during the day and drive a car really fast. (laughs) So there wasn't much not to lie. And I mean, basically, you've played cops and robbers ever since. Um, And you were in the era of uh, 
you know, um, fraternising with the police as well. You, you'd be out having a few beers at the bar after knockoff. Yeah, there was no PR in those days, and we worked in Russell Street. John, what is all the dark things you know? What does that do for your perception of society? Oh, I don't think it's changed me really. I'm 27 years old. So <laughs> it hasn't aged me at all. <laughs> do, do you give up on society or do you just accept that statistically there's going to be demons out there? I'm extremely, extremely optimistic. The, for every one of these dark characters, there's 10 white knights. And when you watch the documentary, you will see 30 years on the commitment that these people made, that they still live with it. And one of those investigators became homicide chief and 25, 25, 27 years later, he had a case of a 17-year-old girl st randomly attacked and stabbed to death in a park. It was so similar to Natalie Russell. Even the wounds were similar. And he looked, and as his predecessor had looked and said, this man's a potential serial killer, he then made a public announcement warning women just at the moment to be very careful in parks. Now, women are absolutely sick of being told to modify their behaviour. It's not their fault. But he got smashed mm, for victim blaming. But I know what he was thinking. He was looking and he was seeing Natalie Russell mm. and he was looking at how they couldn't save her. The difference being with CCTV, they got that guy within, I think, 48 hours. Whereas if they hadn't, he would have been the next Daniel. Wow. Amazing. What, what about your, your life of crime? Sam and Dino and myself fascinated with the figures that you've met over the journey. Who's the most interesting crime figure you've come across? Oh, probably Chopper Reed. I, I, um, Mark was very well known in the underworld, but not that much with the public. So I worked at the Herald Sun at the time. And I wrote a double page spread where I called him all sorts of names. He'd just been acquitted of, uh, of a murder of Sammy the Turk. And he, it, <laughs> He was wearing an armed robbery squad ballistic vest at the time, which confused matters. Yeah. Um, and he said it was a clear-cut case of self-defence when it was cold-blooded murder. So I wrote a story saying he's a cold-blooded murderer. And, and um, I went to work, and in those days you had a pigeonhole, and there was a Christmas card, which surprised me because it was July. And um, it was from Chopper, and it said... Um, Merry Christmas and Jingle Bells. May the Yuletide log fall from your fireplace and burn your house down. Um, <laughs> Jesus. The perfect, uh, my perfect Christmas would be to own a thousand room hotel and find a dead Herald Sun reporter in every room. Uh, seasons greetings and Jingle Bells. <laughs> Jesus. Now, I, I thought I was pretty special until I found out that the head of the parole board, Justice Frank Vincent, got a similar card. And it was a nativity scene with... Jesus loves you, and he opened it up, and in Chopper's hand it said, "But, but personally, I think you're an asshole." <laughs> hey, horseplay, <laughs> horse, a... horseplay, <laughs> best. Horseplay I know you've got a thousand of them. What? I know you've got a thousand of them. But you, oh, are, of course, geez. we should acknowledge if you don't know John Sylvester, he and Andrew Rule are the reason for the underbelly uh, books and television series. Give us your best underbelly story. Oh, probably. I wrote, a, I wrote a story um, which alluded to the fact that Carl Williams was behind it all. And I wrote it and I said they basically used his father, George's car, in an ambush on uh, Nick Radov. Um, and Carl got sad about that and he rang me and said, I want a meeting. I said, well, that's fine. But he was busy at that stage because that was... Do you wear a bulletproof vest from the arm robbery, Scott? <laughs> well, that, that, uh, that night... He'd organised the murder of Graham Kinnebra. So I thought, well, how good is this? I'm getting to go and see the guy. That's the one in Q, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So The Munster. Yeah, and, and sort of Carl turned up with Roberta and, and George, and Carl was in like stubbies and a T-shirt. I'm thinking, you've got to wear a Xenia suit and the dark glasses. Get with the program. Anyway, um, they wanted to, you know, it was all theatre, and they tried to bounce me a bit, but I thought I'd turn the tables. So I said to Carl, who shot you in the guts? because they weren't expecting that. <laughs> and he said, um, who said I was shot in the guts? I said, yeah, you were. You told me you were. Who did it? And he said, oh, I don't know. I said, oh, you're kidding me. You got shot in the guts and you wake up in hospital ice cream and jelly, I got shot in the belly. And you don't actually ask who did it. And he said, oh, the police. The police have got an idea. <laughs> and I said, well, tell me. He said, no, nah, you, you ask them. So I, 
I don't know why, but I grabbed him by his chubby face and said, just do this for me, Jason. Say, Jason, Jason. And Roberta's looking at me going like, you don't know that we organised to have someone killed yesterday. <laughs> and you're turning a gangster into a sock puppet. Right? She absolutely cacked herself laughing yep. at, at the end of it. I mean, these, these people watched the Hollywood movies. Yeah. So when you watch Underbelly and you think, oh, it's a little bit like a Hollywood movie, it is because that's how they live their lives. And, of course, it was banned in Victoria, quite rightly, by Justice Betty King because some of the scenes were so close to the truth. But she was watching it. And at one stage, the Piranha Task Force, you know, the actors come out mm. uh, on the step. But as a private joke, the real Piranha detectives were with them. So she's looking going, well, there's half my witnesses in the series. The really? They're in it? Oh, they used them at one stage for a raid, and, you know, take people down yeah. instead of stuntmen. And the poppers were happy, cause, but they didn't know much about stunt work, so they just bashed them. So they bashed all the actors. And <laughs> when they said take three, the actors are going, oh, no, I think we'll go with take two. <laughs> people, can't, people can't, I know we've got to go, but people can't believe the un, when Underbelly first won, that first season, especially, mm. especially um, John, but pe people were driving to the border to get... Uh, well, know, to asked, get, yeah, yeah to get VHS copies of a sh of a television show that had screened that night in the rest of the country, but not in Victoria, John. Yeah, well, we uh, Andy and I did a book, and we had a, a a funeral scene on the cover. You know, Gangster One Hundred and One, and they're carrying the, the coffin, and gravelly voice rings up and says, "You put my picture in your book," and I think, "Oh, this is going to be interesting," and. Um, the bloke says, well, actually, I'm a part-time actor. Can I get a job? <laughs> <laughs> Stunning. Hey. All oh, right. Hey, John, is, uh... John, can we, hey, we're going to wrap this up, but can we continue this at the Lobster Cave one day? <laughs> For sure. There's also a podcast to go You know, with... get all the plugs out because, yeah, you know, yeah, we, we, yeah. I, we love you. And so the, the Stan original documentary revealed No Mercy, No Remorse, available on Stan. Good, like tomorrow. big budget. It looks unbelievable. Yeah. What's the podcast, mate? Naked City. I could see. It's a great podcast. I've listened to that, John. It's fantastic. It's up there with Brownie's podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> John oh, that, also, that, you know that copper who asked 1,500 questions before he got to the one he wanted? He asked the question earlier. Anyway, that's just my <laughs> thing. Well, why, wait that, why wait that long? John that, Sylvester, thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Well, Chrissy, Sam and Brownie, Ripper Show will be back tomorrow. Chrissy, Sam and Brownie. Unless it's a weekend. Here is a 100.